welcome to our third video on the Jay Report, in which we present in an easily digestible form what the Jay Report has to say in the light of some of the subsequent reports that have been emerging. However, I think we're going to have to touch on some other things which it does not say, because already there is some misunderstanding and perhaps disinformation being talked about. In our first video, we set out the verbatim executive summary and conclusions, reading directly from the report. And then we use the second video to explore the two cornerstone principles for restoring confidence in the Church of England's safeguarding. I set out the way in which English law defines independence first, because the two charities that Jay proposes are very clearly independent, but also because the alternative, non-independence, is what created what the report describes as the collapse of confidence in the present system of operational safeguarding. So let's be clear here, Clive. The present system sees the diocesan safeguarding advisors enmeshed with the diocese and under the bishop's control, however benignly some may exercise it. Absolutely. And we need to be clear, the overwhelming evidence that Professor Jay received was that this was a bad thing. As the report says, our engagement with victims and survivors, those supporting them, safeguarding professionals, church staff, volunteers, and people who had allegations made against them, highlighted a lack of confidence in the present system of church safeguarding. So that is why the report insists on changing this. It's brutally frank, and the criticism does not just come from the consumers of the service. Take this comment from the Church's National Safeguarding Team, the NST. The NST expressed frustration that they were not able to intervene in diocesan safeguarding even when they felt it was not appropriate or did not meet best practice. So even NST members know that the present non-independent model is broken. Conversely, however, one of our bishops is quoted on the subject of the NST. My experience was, as a bishop, seeking to do good safeguarding practice in my role, I found that the national safeguarding team was largely impenetrable. Cases referred to them disappeared into the abyss, and you could never find out what was going on. Wherever they looked, the J team found dysfunctionality. They clearly lay out all the evidence for root and branch reform. Yeah, quite. And we're seeing some bishops suggesting all is well on my patch. But is this universally true? And we have to ask ourselves this question. If the church has great professionals giving good advice and our bishops are doing their job properly, why is the situation so dire and confidence non-existent? Can I touch on conflicts of interest again here? This features directly in the report as a reason to separate control of safeguarding away from the church at diocesan and national level. Yeah, please tell us what the report says. It's short and it's to the point. There are conflicts of interest in several aspects of safeguarding, which are not openly acknowledged or addressed in policy, procedure or practice. This serves to under, further undermine the trust of many of those who need to engage with church safeguarding. So there you have it. If you have independence, no conflict of interest, people might begin to believe that everyone will have as good a safeguarding service in the church as you get in the secular world. But they don't have that now. So let's see what Jay says about getting from here to there and what church safeguarding might look like if her recommendations are implemented and at the same time hopefully dispel some of the myths which are circulating. Well it starts with a simple new chain of command. The lines of accountability must no longer pass through the church but ultimately to two independent sets of charity trustees accountable only to the charity commission. Charity A which will be responsible for providing local safeguarding services at parish and diocesan level, and Charity B, which will operate as a national oversight and guidance body. Their jobs will be simple, unambiguous and clear, keeping everyone safe and our process is fairer for everyone. What does that mean for the existing safeguarding staff, Clive? 
Right, I think we have to start by saying that as far as I can see, moving DSAs from being employed by a Dustin Board of Finance over to being employed by an independent charity would be covered by the TUPI regulations. Now, TUPI stands for Transfer of Undertakings and Protection of Employment. And it's a piece of legislation which protects the rights of employees where a business or how a service is provided and it's moved from one organisation to another. So the first thing is that existing DSAs wouldn't have to worry about their jobs. Under 2P, the DSAs would retain all previous terms and conditions of employment, including recognition of previous service, holiday entitlements, and any other contracted entitlements. Now, this might have a few hiccups because it's not clear whether DSOs are paid on a national scale or according to the local decisions of an individual diocese. Now, there could be a problem if it turned out that one DSO was the bishop's nephew or niece and was getting a million pounds a year in their own palace to live in. But generally, Dustin Boards of Finance are run very carefully. And what is more likely is that one or two DSOs will need to have their salaries increased to bring them into line with their colleagues. What is likely to happen is wider career opportunities and better access to training and support resources dedicated to specialist professionals, as well as in-depth mutual professional support. I've heard one or two rumours that the J report would mean centralisation and a degrading of the relationship between the DSAs and local churches. Shall we see what Jay actually says about that? Well, yeah, we can be quite explicit about that, because not only does the report make quite clear that there is no criticism of the DSA's work on the ground as they go about their activities, but Professor Jay recalls clearly at conclusion five, the physical location of safeguarding staff in dioceses should be retained. Now, I worked for the district audit organisation for a number of years, and I spent a great deal of time based in the physical locations of our audited bodies. Now, this made us highly accessible to our clients, although we normally occupied dedicated secure offices, so we had privacy and confidentiality when we needed it. We used to be very happy to go to meetings, other premises owned by our clients. We were usually well known for making good coffee for meetings, our own accommodation, as well as serving chocolate biscuits, which often attracted people to come and meet in our offices. What I would also expect it to mean, however, is that the relationship between Charity A and each diocese would be defined by a series of service level agreements, which would make it clear what was expected and what would be delivered. And I think it's important to underline that it is only the management structure that shifts, nothing else. However, the shift in that management structure would give individual DSAs more professional authority since they would no longer be answerable to the loss in management, but only to their own managers, and so would always be empowered to pursue excellence and best practice. The DSAs would also be fully enabled to decide how best to deliver these service level agreements. I think this might be a good point to run through the job description of the DSAs and see what could possibly be altered by a simple shift in the lines of accountability. Now we'll find these in the Diocesan Safeguarding Advisors Regulations of 2016. We will shorten and paraphrase these, but they are quite clear, so let's just run through the checklist. It begins with the functions of Diocesan Safeguarding Advisors. A, where an allegation that a child or vulnerable person has suffered abuse is made, the allegation should be referred to the police for investigation and if the advisor thinks it should be referred, making the referral. No change there. B. Cooperating with and supporting the work of the police, local authority and other bodies. No change there. Giving advice, information and support in a timely fashion to those who have suffered abuse. No change there. Giving advice to the bishop and other church officers in the diocese on safeguarding matters. That will still happen under heading E, coordinating the work of the diocesan safeguarding panel. Now, this will change in its nature since the DSA will now be an independent advisor to these panels. F, providing or coordinating the provision of training on safeguarding matters. As now. G, Implementing or coordinating the implementation of the guidance issued by the House of Bishops on safeguarding matters. 
Well, that just shifts over to the new safeguarding charity B, but that can be done in consultation with the bishops. H says, giving advice, information and support to parochial church councils and parish safeguarding officers on the implementation of that guidance and, where appropriate, challenging parochial church councils and parish safeguarding officers on what they have done to implement that guidance. Now, plainly, the new charity will want to continue and possibly grow that, since it'd be possible to invest in national support and training resources, which could then be supported locally. I says, issuing guidance on safeguarding matters for church officers in the diocese and parish safeguarding officers in any parish in the diocese that is consistent with the guidance issued by the House of Bishops. Well, that's a distribution and communication point. But the content will come from the new objective independent charities, not from the church. Jay says where the advisor thinks that the safeguarding matters are not being dealt with properly, it has not proved possible to resolve within the diocese the points at issues informing the Archbishop's Council. Now, this is where the existence of two separate charities improves the quality of safeguarding. If Charity A is dissatisfied about a safeguarding matter in a diocese, it could potentially escalate that to Charity B, who could not only intervene directly with the diocese, but also refer it up to the Archbishop's Council. Now, this is quite a step up in terms of service quality, since hopefully very few matters would need to be raised with the Archbishop's Council. In addition, of course, Charity B would have an inspection role in relation to the performance of Charity A. And where a diocese was dissatisfied with the actions of Charity A, they too could approach Charity B. Paragraph K says where a clergy risk assessment is required to be carried out, making the arrangements for it to be carried out. Now, this may be coordinated by the charity. The good thing about that is both complainants and respondents say they are not currently consulted about letters of instruction and terms of reference. In the secular world, the identification of the right experts and questions is dealt with by agreement, and that secures an outcome everyone can have confidence in. Plainly, the independent charity will arbitrate disputes, but with no conflicts of interest. Paragraph L. Where a non-clergy risk assessment is required to be carried out, either carrying out the assessment or making the arrangements for it to be carried out. Well, the same points apply in that case. Paragraph M. Giving advice to the bishop and other church officers in the diocese on the conduct of a clergy or non-clergy risk assessment. And where such an assessment has been carried out, advising on the steps to take, take in the light of it and monitoring any such steps as may be then taken. Well, that will change. The discussions will be with the charity professionals. Bishops will simply receive advice from their professionals, and that should make things much easier for them. Paragraph N, promoting good practice on safeguarding matters. Well, that will continue with additional resources potentially provided countrywide. Paragraph O, taking such other action in connection with safeguarding matters as the advisor considers necessary or appropriate. Now, this work will be a matter for discussion between the DSA and the charity, and I could envisage that there being regional support groups of DSA colleagues to offer support and advice to individual DSAs where this might be required. There would also be proper escalation routes if a local DSA's professional opinion was that something was necessary, but they were opposed within the diocese. Equally, this would operate a safety valve against a DSA asking for something unreasonable. That is really important, Clive. We know of at least one case where a DSA was insisting that all complainants must be believed. Now, that was an approach that the law sensibly rejected 30 years ago. The fact that the DSA had not got the memo is very alarming. The well-established and balanced view is, of course, that one should always listen to the complainant and take what they say seriously. But I just want to interject here and say that there is a problem because not all DSAs are professionally regulated. But under the new charitable structure, they will all have a degree of quality control. It's nigh on impossible under the present system to correct such problems if the bishop and DSA are obstinate. Reform is glacially slow and injustice abound under a more, but under a more independent structure, 
injustice and occasional incompetence can be more quickly addressed by a body whose only job is to bring our safeguarding up to the standards that we take for granted in secular settings. If the charity breaches a person's human rights, they can be sued in the civil courts or reported to the Charity Commission. They will have only one job and be expected to do it with impartiality and expertise. And that is really where we need to aim for. Up until now, the church has not had confidence in its capacity to do safeguarding consistently and well, owing to a lack of good DSA safeguarding advice provided by well-resourced, consistent teams across the country. We're in a mess for a reason, and Professor Jay has explained clearly why that is and what needs to be done about it. So we have set out what the Jay report says, why independence and eliminating conflicts of interests are crucial, and why these reforms will not negatively impact the day-to-day -day delivery of safeguarding on the ground. All we can hope now is that the church is smart enough to take good advice when it is offered without being tempted to tinker with it. I would like to close by reminding our viewers of the warning that former Independent Safeguarding Board member Steve Reeves gave to the General Synod in July 2023. But when the church says independence, it really means semi-detached. This has to change. And I'd like to close by quoting something recently said by the Right Reverend Dr. Helen Ann Hartley, the Bishop of Newcastle, that implementing the J recommendations would afford the opportunity to establish a body that other faiths and Christian denominations might use. Professor Alexis Jay has, in my opinion, opened a way to allow not only the Church of England to excel in its safeguarding practices, but also to enable other churches to improve their practices so that every place of worship is safe and the scandals of the past can be consigned to the past. Professor Alexis Jay has been responsible for highlighting the weaknesses in safeguarding in churches. The Church of England is currently a complex mare's nest comprised of 42 charities of variable inconsistent quality and a chaotic superstructure of committees which cannot sort out problems quickly and have not addressed injustices or held people to account. Neither is there any transparency. This needs to change. The J Review is offering a clear path to putting things right. Let us hope that everyone has the good sense to listen to her. Thank you for joining us in considering these reports. Now we must await the outputs of the church's response group. And when we have them, we will then release a fourth video examining what they have to say. So we'll see you again soon.